My name is Joseph Wunderlich. I'm a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science. And this is a review of the third part of a high tech class. Share screen. This is my website of uh, architecture and computer engineering. <clears throat> so we're in computer engineering and uh, looking at. Uh, so the by, and this course is merging together by intensely combining. I knew that I didn't just put that on there, but two courses of the past, uh, Digital Design One, which I taught for 23, 24 years, also taught at Purdue University and uh, partly as the University of Delaware also. Um, merge with this course with a lab. So it's pretty intense on the students and so I've got periodic lecture review videos <clears throat> broken into sections. There's the first section, combinational circuits, second section, a continuation of combinational circuits, and now sequential circuits. <clears throat> and so that's this video here. So the main concept there, is that we learned during combinational circuit design how to do all of this stuff here, uh, <clears throat> combinational logic. And now we've added, added memory flip-flops. And so we have uh, storage of previous outputs, which are state variables for the finite state machine. And then we feed those back for the next time step on the finite state machine of how this circuit will respond, the overall cloud here as a sequential circuit, and we deal with synchronous circuits here. Oops. So the first is this. Uh, waveforms analysis, finite state machines, and my 13 steps of sequential circuit design. I have eight combinational steps and now 13 for sequential. And so already going through all of this. Again, we do mostly, or we do all synchronous circuits here as opposed to asynchronous or pulse. And uh, so students take a look at some of that. This is mostly this little sheet for reference here because we're doing all synchronous circuits. They learn about basic memory elements and how they respond, the analysis using characteristic tables, not the excitation table, but a characteristic table of how this memory device responds and this, the uh, stored value of Q will respond in combination of the inputs and the clock on the clock edge. And these are positive edge triggered. In this case, it can have negative also. Here's an RS flip-flop. This is a two input device. So there's two inputs plus the clock edge uh, that determines the output transition and what shows up on the output state. Uh, there's two other types. So we just looked at the RS and the D. There's also J, K, and T. And those are at, these are the behave, this is the behavior for circuit analysis that we just saw above. This is what we use for design. And there we ask ourselves, to get the present, to get the state transition we're looking for in state variables, what do we put in front of the flip-flops and the inputs to give us this behavior? That's different than analyzing how the thing behaves like we did above that, we're designing with it. Basic terminology here of inputs and outputs and uh, rising and trailing edges falling, or positive versus negative, rising, falling edges the finite state machine and how that works, inputs that cause a state transition over outputs caused by the transition and how that works uh, and the number of inputs and how that affects how many arrows come out of each state uh, to reflect the number of inputs. Um, outputs, you can have any number you wish coming out. The number of states depends on the problem. The number of flip-flops depends on the number of states. Uh, we'll go through all the steps here, but here's all the steps of sequential design. And students have already gone through this and done some labs and uh, the details of that. And then there's different examples here, given a 
finite or given a word problem, make a finite state machine, then uh, design it, come up with a state table. State table represents the finite state machine, represents the word problem. Another one here. And, uh, the other steps, noticing you could actually simplify this machine if you needed to. And then once you have the state table from the state diagram, you append flip-flop inputs, depending on which flip-flop you're asked to use. And then you determine uh, the logic that goes in front you know, of these uh, inputs based on the map and logic like this. More complicated design here, detecting an input sequence of four ones. Uh, that could be the entire problem statement. You need to be able to come up with a diagram that reflects that. Uh, look at the machine minimization, whether or not that's worth trying to do. Do a state table, flip flops, inputs, and then compare the different designs, noticing that uh, these single input flip flops, the Ds and Ts, uh, have less tables and so you know less design work but end up often resulting in more um more of the um, gates needed then we looked at unused states so if you don't have a power of two number of states by virtue of the way you assign state variables you're going to have an unused state so here we have three states and we need two bits to differentiate three states but two extra permutations of those bits exists by virtue of the fact that there's an odd number of states. So we deal with that in a certain way. We don't want to have a false output if, we're, if this is essentially an error state. We leave blank where it's going to transition to. We can make some assumptions here that uh, it will transition out of that unused state and we have a flag for that and then we check our assumptions. So we design the whole thing and then once we've designed it, we go back and analyze now, not using excitation tables, but characteristic tables. And we look and see that the unused state actually did transition out. And so you got to look at how that works. You got to put the unused states and the variables and then evaluate using the equations from above here, what all the inputs are, and then look at the characteristic table and ask yourself one variable. And, um, um, that works. Okay. Then we look at uh, more problems here. This is a previous homework assignment. So as part of merging a couple of courses together, the students aren't doing homeworks in here. I'm just handing out previous solutions and then they have a lab and plenty of effort goes into that. So this was a previous homework assignment where we just take uh, this example we just looked at and we can just say it only detect two inputs. It's a much simpler design and uh, that was a homework. Then we have design uh, with unused states. We just looked at that. This is just a more detailed look at this one particular problem of the unused state uh, <clears throat> that we just looked at, but breaking it down one piece at a time and looking at asking yourself what's going on. So the students can go and look at that and have more explanation of each little piece and um, <clears throat> why it is the way it is. We won't go through that now. details there. Scroll slowly in case this, well, this is a video, so just you know, slow it down. Take a look at all that if you like. Then we did um, <clears throat> more problems with unused states here. Uh, this is just another, you know, the problem we just looked at, and then you're just doing it. Uh, what did it ask you to do here? It's, it says, uh, well, this is a counter first, and then the other one is redoing the problem we just looked at uh, with uh, three zero, detecting three zeros instead of three ones. So the counter 
is we're going to talk about in a second here, counters. So uh, this is that same problem, but you're detecting zeros now instead of ones. And so that just looks like all that down here. This one, okay. Now we look at counters. Um, well, now debouncing, we, uh, I'll just show this very quickly and I'm probably gonna move this down or even maybe even eliminate this, but this is important just to understand as a concept that uh, switches will bounce. Mechanical switches actually have physical bounces, which then create electrical bounces. And you're doing things in sequential circuits on the clock edges. So you could accidentally create more than one edge. Uh, there's ways to deal with that with uh, a capacitor and a, a, a Schmidt trigger um, inverter. And you, you know, there's ways of dealing with that. And so this is more reference in this class because this class now is not just computer engineers as it had been in the past where they have electronics, analog circuits coming in here, but now we have a variety of students in here, different backgrounds. And so, uh, and there's also software ways, which we're gonna learn to, what you're doing is debouncing. So you either find a way to use analog circuits to get around the multiple bounce or and we'll probably maybe come back to this, maybe in a lab, use software where you actually wait out the bounce. You, like you're pulling an input that's on a toggle switch, you know, uh, repeatedly in a scan loop of a PLC or in your code, keep reading the pin over and over again. Uh, so you delay, you just delay the read to give it time to finish bouncing. And there's code for that, we'll look at that later. Uh, and then there's other things in here about uh, debouncing. Just look at real quickly here. This is timing diagrams and how you would actually do it with uh, with logic gates. With a uh, this is for a toggle switch and getting your bounce. Uh, you're designing electrically. You using the delays and the feedback of the circuit to compensate for the bounce and lock it out lock out the bounce. Again, I'm debating this would probably just be a reference in this course because we've really merged quite a bit into this class. Uh, there's one more here. It's just the reverse. Of, uh, it's just the same kind of thing here, but switching the other way and uh, locking out the bounce and these delays, nanoseconds, you know, less than mechanical, electrical versus mechanical kind of thing. <clears throat> it's good for mechatronics. There's a couple of mechatronics students in here. So this actually is a good thing to um, maybe in the future or even teach. Oh, this is where I could teach it actually. Well, let's give it some fun. There's a lot in here right now in this class. <laughs> then um, counters. So now counters are a special case. There's no input. You become the clock. The outputs are going to just be the state variables being output. Uh, because there's no input, other than, you know, physical input other than you being the clock, you don't need multiple arrows. You're just transitioning around some fixed count and you're going to output the state variables. And so you don't need uh, to do anything special there. You're just outputting state variables and you design around that, just like the other kinds. Uh, and you know, design everything. Now you are the clock here. You are the clock going into the clock. So you're creating that clock edge. This is a logic one just coming in here and off the five volt power supply. Um, then you analyze the unused states because you were given a fixed uh, count here, but there's not. Uh, this is a BCD counter, so you're mix. You're missing a number of permutations of variables that you have to deal with. Um, the uh, non, uh, here, these non-BCD numbers where you don't try to force it to go anywhere. However, it's an error state in reality in real machines inside IBM, we'd always uh, make sure we accounted for every possible scenario, not just, you know, this was a rare thing to do in reality. If you know an error state can exist, it will exist at some point, especially on mission critical machines. 
um, simple devices. People often just do this kind of thing. And, and all the academic books I've looked at, this is including this course, the reference book by Mano that everybody's used, I used in the 1980s, <laughs> learned from it, used it. Uh, this is what you do. You don't force the onion state to go someplace. You don't know where it goes. You design the whole circuit and you put don't care conditions here. But in reality, you probably want to really know or you want to control where it goes. You want to have absolute knowledge if an error state is created. Because if you're doing it, for example, the uh, System 390 machines I worked on, IBM were running air traffic control with those things on the New York Stock Exchange, military systems. Uh, you know, there's no excuse for not accounting for errors. So then you analyze these unused states. We mentioned how to do that before you just use the equations from the design to fill it, you know, put all your unused states, but the equations, uh, evaluate the equations for each input, and then use a characteristic cable. Even this, this, this is a design process now, but we've designed the circuit, and now we're going back and analyzing where the unused state goes. So yes, characteristic tables are used as part of the design process, but for unused states. We see what we get, where they go. Again, error states, be careful in red. Then we have another fixed sequence here, some arbitrary sequence I made up. Uh, you know, you to design that now in this case, the uh, unused states are somewhere, you know, randomly in the sequence, but you don't want to change the order of your counting here. So when you do your permutations of variables, you don't just take this unused state, this 0, 1, 1, which doesn't exist on this given sequence. You don't put that down the bottom because you're going to change your min terms the way they line up and mess up your maps. This order has to be preserved in counting order, you know, 0 to 7 here, or your maps will mess up. Students often make that mistake. Uh, other than that, it's the same as the other counter. And then we just analyze these two unused states here using, again, the characteristic table, putting, evaluating these equations, then using the characteristic table to see one state variable at a time, what happens based on the inputs at that event time and see where they go here. Right. Change your state table, I mean, your state diagram to reflect where the unused state goes. Then uh, more with counters here. This is that uh, other, that same homework I showed you before, but now this is a different count here. And so uh, that counter is here, this count, and you see you know, what that one looks like, where there's unused states go after analyzing. So there's two examples there. There are several examples for counters. Then the CPU pipeline. Now that's part of this paper here, which is a bunch of stuff that I've taught over a number of courses. I wrote this uh, while I was a professor at Purdue University and then uh, on my way to Elizabethtown. So I give credit to both schools because I uh, actually wrote it while I was at Purdue. But there's a million things in here. Students first need to learn the minimal computer architecture to understand how a pipeline works so that you know how to drive that with a finite state machine. So they have to memorize all this, make sure this makes sense, all the parts of the computer or of the architecture and how they function, which is some language in here. And then this particular time we look at this, uh, this uh, handout here, we look, we're looking really at the pipeline itself and then how that works in time fetch decode execute simplest pipeline now th these aren't parallel pipeline it's, it's not super scalar here super scalar you'd have uh, you know two fetches at a time kind of thing this is just the pipeline how uh, you know, single issue instruction not multiple issue super scalar works learn about that in parallel processing and basic phases of fetch decode execute and how that works on the on the computer architecture that the students have memorized by that time and then decoding into opcodes and operands whatever the machine instruction format looks like how the opcodes telling you which instruction it is versus operands work you know, different size instruction sets. We could have up to 2,000 instructions at IBM. We went from about 1,400 to 1,600 when I was there. 
Uh, so you have a lot of bits in your opcode to allow for a lot of instructions. And then decoding, and there's different, depending, uh, there can be numerous uh, addressing modes, but the simplest ones will be like immediate memory reference and register reference. What the students learn about uh, and minimal architecture and then a million different things you can do based on your execution of whatever's going on and then a write back phase if you have to deal with some overhead of going to main memory. And then this is more of reference down here an IBM um, publication, optimal pipeline depth for microprocessor. Uh, I attempted to organize an internal conference in IBM when I was up there, and, and uh, it actually got canceled by the CEO at the last minute because there was fear of uh, intellectual property slipping out the door. We have super high security, a helicopter flying around 24 hours a day and drills, interior offices, no exterior offices, so we couldn't have spies and things figuring out what we're doing. <laughs> IBM is a big, giant company. I still consider myself IBMer, even though that was a long time ago, almost 30 years now. And then we get into machine design now. Um, and Again, this is a review of how the different uh, things work. And so now we're we're doing a basic uh, sketch of a, a machine to design, and so we're we're picking a bus width and number of registers, and we're I'm designing an instruction set here. This is my own just made up thing with my own syntax and my own register transfer notation, talking about how this works. This varies on different machines how register transfer notation is is, and the syntax also varies too. Uh, microprocessors versus microcontrollers, you know, Motorola versus IBM versus Spark and MIPS, and everybody has their own way of doing things. <clears throat> and I've, I've learned all those. Uh, and IBM, our machines, as well as the, the PowerPC chip and the system 390s. Um, so we have some basic instructions register reference and memory reference. And we have notation designating, these are like pointers actually. So up here, you're getting data right out of the registers. Down here, you are looking in the register for a memory address. And in reality, you're going to then uh, initiate another finite state machine that will be doing the communication protocol with the external memory, depending where it is. So just in a simple PC, you have to get down off the processor, go across the front side bus on the motherboard at a slower speed, uh, inter interact with the RAM, uh, which is at another speed, and also have uh, like semi-foreign control signals saying, okay, are you ready, memory? Yes, or, you know, or here come, okay, is, is the address I just sent you stable enough to send me data? Have I waited long enough in the thing? Okay, yeah, here goes, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you have to set that all up. You actually design that uh, inside the processor to allow for delays, you know, then the actual um, finite state machine for all that is inside of the processor. The memory is a, is a slave to the master, it's a master slave situation, just what it's called. So uh, then we look at our instruction formats and uh, how we break that down, the opcode versus the operand fields. In this case, we have uh, the way my syntax works is I have register, register, register. Uh, you can do this with just two registers and it's implied that the result will go into one of the registers. That's the way some machines work. But here I have three registers. So I have, uh, and they're uh, uh, yeah, designated as zero, 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 one, and one, zero. And so um, this is you know, how this syntax of this code I made manifests itself in the bits. And then the opcode, just for the eight instructions, there's, uh, we need three bits. And it's not arbitrary how I've assigned the uh, bits here. I've made it such that the first bit actually means something. So if you're creative, uh, inventive uh, with what you're doing, uh, especially 
talking about 2,000 instructions like inside IBM, you're saving, you're speeding up the machine if you can detect certain things happening before, uh, you know, before otherwise. So here, this first bit will tell you these are register reference and, and being a zero in the first bit here, the app code will say, okay, this is memory reference and you'll, you can start up that whole uh, other finite state machine I talked talk about for dealing with external memory. And then just somehow that look, how that looks architecturally and then designing the control unit based on that and how that finite state machine looks there, understanding that uh, in this case, we're assuming that there's no extra memory time here if you have certain instructions that don't need to have, use external memory. Now, this is not always true. There's actually an external bus or an internal bus that does need to communicate, but it's at the speed of the processor. If it's in the registers, it's at the speed of the processor and it's on the same piece of silicon. If you have to go out to external memory, as I mentioned, uh, that can definitely be expensive depending on the machine. So that's why there's a variation there. And then we design all that. We design that thing. We notice you know, that the only difference in the path here is this one bit, the first bit of the opcode telling you whether or not you need to do extra time for the memory access. A million different kind of things we could do for the execute phase and then uh, actually designing it. So the fetch decode execute right back with two state variables for the four states in our state diagram. The only thing making a difference uh, in you know, coming into this machine is, for this case, the first bit of the opcode. And then we're just using JKs, just say sim use JKs, and so we use JKs, we use excitation table to design it, we design it, and uh, then we move on here and look at code examples here of uh, different kinds of code examples and how that will look in the registers versus main memory, depending on the type of instructions, whether you're using main memory or not, whether there's pointers in the registers or actual data in the registers, depending on the type of instruction. You know, I use this at symbol in my assembler syntax to donate this. You know, this is going to be using a memory access. The register contents will be addresses of data in memory, not just data. And then here's another example of mixed use going in and out of main memory and RAM. I'm sorry, in and out of main memory, which is RAM, and the registers. Registers typically, it depends on the machine, of course. And we'll learn about this. Microcontrollers will have the, the, the memory as just the monolithic uh, stepped increase contiguous with the area where the registers are. The stacks in there too, and you can actually overwrite things if you're not careful. The stack, your stack can grow on top of your register contents. <clears throat> but that that's that's a special device on typical bigger machines and microprocessors, PCs, any larger machine will have external memory, which will be more costly to access than the register set on, on the silicon next to the uh, you know in the central processing unit. And we haven't talked about caches and everything in here. That's part of uh, advanced uh, design parallel processing. A couple of weeks just on cache design in there. Um, and so yeah, uh, so that's that. And then we'll be going in here. We'll delve, delve into all this, but we're going to uh, learn some assembly language. Now, this is not a whole course on assembly language, but that's what we're going next. And then, um, and then we're going to squeeze in here also uh, relays and programmable logic controllers. This is especially important for the mechatronic students in here. Uh, we really should have a lab, and I effectively have had labs when I teach the robotics and machine intelligence class, because uh, that's where you need to interface with uh, mechanical systems, your electrical controllers, your robots. Do that. So, you know, there's uh, publications I've had in the past and other things in simulation versus real time. And the students learn firsthand in here, we'll just wrap up with that, that uh, we've got circuit trainers that are breaking. We have, uh, stop sharing here for a second. We have uh, even our bolt meters, which are messing up. And if you go, you know, inside of that, you see that, uh, you know, that looks like, 
this on the inside. And there's a battery as well as a fuse. And so uh, I'm diagnosing why this particular one wasn't working and the battery was actually working, but the fuse was blown up and blown out. And you use another multimeter to figure that out. And so we've got, we've got just meters breaking. We've got breadboards that don't work anymore. We've got a mix of, unfortunately, CMOS chips with uh, PTL bipolar uh, five volts chips versus three and a half volt chips. And the students had to find out the hard way. Uh, it's actually a good lesson in having uh, things not work, but um, there was enough headache in this class just merging two previous pretty intense courses into one. So these guys are gonna be cut a lot of slack in grading and otherwise, because they're the guinea pigs for the first iteration of this and have had to deal with a number of uh, unfortunate headaches. So there'll always be some headache when you're dealing with devices. The reason I'm mentioning that is, uh, you know, it's always a part of this class, but um, in this real time publications versus simulation, they use logism in here. And a lot of these things, the multimeter's not working, breadboard's not working, you know, CMOS chips accidentally mixed in with TTL chips. Um, you're not going to see the simulation. You're not going to see that simulation. So you need to understand. And, and the, first, you know, the very first time I actually taught a simulation course as a computer science class, and uh, we were doing all code, uh, I did robots as examples. And the uh, very first case studies we did, we made actual physical little robots. We get uh, these uh, Mindstorm robots and we overrode the code for them in a Visual Basic was one and a version of C with another in the basic RC RCX code that for the real-time robots on the ground. And then the students had to make simulations in parallel that on the day of the event, the robot would be put, the real robot on the floor, have to navigate through a maze uh, and then the simulation would run and I would you know, they'd have to give me the ability to pick the, the initial location and orientation of the robot and searching for a light on a virtual uh, you know, rendition of the real maze on the ground with a real light and, and an obstacle course that I built out of wood from my barn and see how well the simulation matched up with the real time. And this is a, a serious thing because if, you, you know, if, you, if you're relying on simulation all the time, uh, that can be a, a, a real uh, uh, thing that come up, bites you in the butt, because um, in reality, things go wrong. So uh, in, in the robots on the ground, we had the case where the batteries in the actual robots would uh, wear, you know, lose power. And so the, the, actual, the movement that you would expect to get out of each you know, iteration of move in the control loop was decaying over time. And also the range of the sensors you had to assume a depth of field that the, the, the light sensor that was looking for the light that had and, and the range of that. And um, that could actually vary with that every power too. So, uh, and the friction on the slippage of wheels, even though you have feedback from the, uh, the wheel encoders telling you how many rotations the wheel have, if it slips and you're basing that on, um, and you're basing your position, your pose estimation of where that robot is in space, on uh, feedback from the previous actuation signals to the motors for rotation, and then in a slippage, you lose where you really are. And that's why in the big robots, when we've been in competition, you need multiple things you're looking at. You are for actually PID control in the control theory terms, looking at uh, you know, the, the feedback for each actuation to maintain stable control over the robot, in a you know engineering fashion, but you're also using global positioning systems and digital compasses and vision systems, and you're doing sensor fusion to get an accurate uh, pose. You know, pose as in not just position, but the way you're pointed. So position and orientation. And if you're talking about three, you know, uh, fighter planes or other things. It's not just uh, you know x y axis on the ground. You have a z axis, and you also have a pitch roll and yaw. It's also for you know, fighter planes and, and uh, submarines and other things. Um, and and you'll run simulations concurrently too. A typical fighter jet will have a simulation running concurrent to what the pilot is doing in the cockpit. So that, you know in a dogfight, the the pilot needs complete control to 
uh, you know, but he may be turning so many G's, he might black out for a second trying to escape being killed. Uh, and uh, the autopilot, the simulation running concurrently, will keep him from running into the ground or, you know, take over to some extent, may even take over the, the finishing some of the fighting if you can get AI into the into it, which is now happening. Okay. So we've had a lot of students who go on to do military things. I don't teach per se anything military-wise, but the concepts extend. And we have quite a few students you know, working for Lockheed, Raytheon, Boeing. Uh, 